Well, good day, folks. Uh, my name's Peter Arkell. Uh, my, I don't know whether you can tell from my accent, but I'm uh, I'm from China. I, uh, <laughs> I'm the uh, the chairman of the uh, of GMAC, which is the Global Mining Association of China, and uh, I'm very happy to be hosting uh, this session, which is um, the super region spotlight powering the growth of mineral supply chain uh, infrastructure. We've got a, got a fabulous panel. We haven't got much time to explore a, a pretty big topic. So uh, bear with us, we'll do our best and uh, thank you very much for your interest. So I think what we'll do, fellas, to get started is just tell these guys uh, who we are and then we'll get down into business. Michael, okay. you start. Uh, Michael Willoughby, I'm Global Head of Metals and Mining and Transition Materials at HSBC. I was at uh, Standard Chartered for a few years, JP Morgan for 22 years, lived in Japan, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Peter. Andrew Starkey, uh, Executive Chair of a group of companies called Medeca uh, from Indonesia. Uh, I guess relevant to this conference given our position uh, in nickel and nickel battery materials. Uh, been at the company now for, for a number of years and a, a mining finance background. Thank you. Uh, Tom Kendall, I'm with ICBC Standard Bank. I'm based in London. I run the bank's global metals financing and trading business. Uh, ICBC Standard Bank, essentially a, a JV between China's largest bank, Industrial Commercial Bank of China and Standard Bank of uh, South Africa. Yeah, uh, my name is Nariman Absametov. I am a CFO of Talk and Samruk uh, mining company. We are the Kazakhstani-based uh, local partner for such giants as Glencore, uh, FMG, Rio, and others. And you might mention that company is in Kazakhstan. Yeah, the, all of them, they are present and they, we have a GVs with them, so. <laughs> Thanks, and I'm, I'm Matt Fifield, and I run Pacific Road Capital. We're a metals and mining private equity firm, concentrated investments around the world, uh, running around $800 million of commitments, predominantly from U.S. investors. Well, thanks, everybody. So Matt, uh, Matt's actually, uh, Michael, I beg your pardon, has, um, has come here off the slopes uh, in Switzerland to, uh, to be with us today. So we'll get you started. You let, you're, you're running downhill already. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps <laughs> you could set the scene for us. Tell us uh, a little bit about uh, what you see the broad considerations are for our topic and, uh, and what's the scope for growth in this critical minerals area. So I think the topic is super region. Okay, and that's, that's, an op that's an admirable aim and optimistic, but in reality, the industrial supply chain for EVs and most of these sub-segments are, are global. You know, j just take the s semiconductor supply chain, which has 320 suppliers in 50 different countries. All of those suppliers are basically an oligopoly. They do what they do best, and they reinvest back into that technology. EVs are are the same. You know, it, it, I think, I think it's, it's not constructive to look at a country or even a region as doing end-to-end -end EVs. It's, it's just not, it's, it's not likely to be cost competitive. You, you do what you do well, so Indonesia does nickel well, Australia and Argentina do lithium well, China does precursor well, you know, batteries are done by different players and you'll effectively have an oligopoly all the way up until the vehicle producer and that can be a lot more Diversified, so I think that's one fallacy to to kind of stop. The second one is financial. You know, why are emerging companies and countries so competitive in the space? Well, their cost of equity capital is far lower. Why is that? Well, Western capital markets are completely institutionalized. They want you know their cash flows to match their financial obligations over the next 20 years, which is effectively infrastructure. You can't have volatility in those returns, and that is the very definition of an upstream company. And then those upstream companies, if they're linked to the midstream companies, well, where does a Western company get the capital to invest in that technology and the capital equipment with no defined return? So the, the over-institutionalization of the Western market makes it far less competitive in a global setting for the EV supply chain, which is why China, and to a lesser extent, Indonesia and others, and now Morocco and Saudi and, and others can join because their cost of capital is, is simply lower. And then, then the other layer is geopolitics. Well, you know, and I, I, diversity of supply chain, okay, I get it. That's, that's the right way to think about it. But to try and exclude China from the supply chain, well, let's just think about it. China 
Without Chinese investment in EV components and the upstream, we're not driving EVs today in any sort of numbers you know, that are relevant. So thank you very much for supplying the components that allow us to transition our economies far faster. Okay, now we look at diversity of supply chain. Well, let's not think about it in terms of Saudi or the US saying we need to mine, produce, do everything where we are. Let's take the best in class technology Let's put it in a geography where it can be competitive in power and labor costs. Otherwise, you're just simply building a very, very high cost supply chain that is not going to be competitive in a very competitive <coughs> consumer market, which is the EV. That sounds great. So, uh, Andrew, you're, uh, you're in Indonesia that, that uh, Michael referred to, and um, uh, your company's Medeca Copper Gold and Medeca Battery Materials. So, this is perhaps a, a test case for this super region that we're talking about. So what's, what's made Indonesia such a significant player now in this, uh, in this part of the, the, the uh, value chain? Yeah, I, th I think that's right. We're talking about um, how supply chains might change, how countries that have historically just been raw material providers uh, can participate more in that value adding stream to the extent that they have, um, have uh, competitive advantages as Michael's referred to. So Indonesia, I suppose, it's always had a policy of, um, of national ownership of major mining assets. So you started with a, uh, a regulation in place that ensured that key assets would, would be held uh, in, in national hands. Um, and then that was supplemented with a policy that put limits on what type of refining and processing should take place in the country before, um, before exports were, were available. And the, and the success that the, the sector that's really benefited has been the nickel sector. Um, Indonesia, along with the Philippines, was synonymous with, uh, with, with exporting one to two percent grade nickel ores, uh, primarily to, to China. Uh, almost overnight, the regulation came in. Uh, and there was certainly some dislocation during that period. The processing facilities hadn't been established. Uh, a number of the mining companies had no obvious end markets at that time. But within fairly short order, again, thanks primarily to Chinese capital, um, there was a sector developed, initially um, nickel pig iron, uh, RKF, and now when we look forward and think about critical materials and Indonesia's role of supplying well over 50% of the nickel required for, uh, for nickel-based battery chemistry, uh, that's come about through this uh, establishment of the high-pressure acid leach plants uh, in Indonesia. Um, again, that regulation, um, and I think it was more than a regulation, it was very clear to these Chinese investors and subsequently Western and Korean and others have followed, but it was very clear that this was a, uh, a policy supported consistently and, and determinedly by the president and by a very specific minister who took it upon himself to ensure that uh, foreign investors that were prepared to invest in this um, uh, enhancement of the supply chain in Indonesia through processing materials had one place to visit. Um, there were no niggling issues at the regional level, at um, sundry departments. You could go to one place, uh, you could present your pitch, and you could receive um, care and attention the whole way through as your, as your project was put mm. forward. So I think it's a combination in summary of, of course, the, the natural mineral endowment. Indonesia had that. It had the wherewithal to put in a policy that was unpopular and caused some dislocation. And then it was able to attract uh, the private capital, uh, offshore primarily, to um, pursue the development uh, again, with the consistency of government policy that they would stand by these businesses that had invested on the basis that um, their products were going to be exportable. So that, that's how I'd summarise the way Indonesia's achieved this position. Yeah. So that was, that was uh, quite a, you know, a <coughs> deliberate and an almost aggressive move by the Indonesian government, but they've had some opposition to this, haven't they? They've, they've, they've had to fight off a few challenges in this area. Yeah, it, it's... Um, it's uh, not the only sector where, where Indonesia and, and, and other developing countries have had a different opinion in terms of um, uh, trade and, and what should happen within a country's boundaries and, and, and outside of it. Um, and it probably relates to that theme of international investors really knew that the Indonesian government meant it and wasn't going to waver and, and hasn't. So I think yeah. the, the return on investment from these the, the first generation of processing plants is, is already uh, well and truly positive and, and attractive. So the Indonesian government has, has absorbed some of that international pressure. 
Uh, and there's, there's lots of arguments I won't get into now as to you know, the merits of transporting 1% nickel um, in, in freighters across the South China Sea versus doing the processing in Indonesia um, and what's best for, for global trade and, yeah. and any ESG considerations. But um, the policy uh, hasn't changed and doesn't look like it will change following the next, the next set of, of elections. Yeah, just a, one more follow-up question. The, um, and thinking about Medeca in, in particular, the, um, and, and, and linking it to Michael's uh, point about the supply chain, you're, you're shipping 1%, uh, not shipping 1%, you're, you're shipping refined nickel, but that's not the end of the product. It's, it's going somewhere else. You're still in that, that uh, process. Well, that, that, that's right, and uh, I'm glad you've raised that point. We, we would naturally think of sending the product north, uh, wh whether it's to China, whether it's to Korea, uh, potentially Europe, but I guess a, a forum like this reminds us that there are other potential future destinations because it's in Indonesia's largely stopping at the MHP product, so a real intermediate battery material. Um, of course, there's discussions of going further downstream, but Indonesia will be a net exporter of that critical battery material uh, for, for a long time to come. So that, that MHP and looking at supply chains aside from the uh, the, the generic uh, Northeast Asia supply chains is, is something that the Indonesian producers are, are looking at as well. Yeah, uh, and I guess uh, to your point, Michael, there's a, a technology issue at the end of that process where it, where it actually ends up to become the, the battery grade material. Look, the, you know, the technology surrounding nickel chemistry in batteries is very, very consolidated. To, to just think that you are you know, somehow going to catch up with recycling, with nickel chemistry, with, you know, cam technology, anode technology, uh, and you're going to scale it using Western Capital all at once as a startup. And I can, I can name five companies that are trying to do that. It's just not going to happen. There's, there's too much going on and it's changing too fast. The best that a country can hope for is Let's bring the supply chain onshore, let's establish it, and then as technology changes, you can displace the technology over time, if that's your concern. You know, for, for Saudi, Saudi should be thinking, right, let's bring the best-in-class technology, the best-in-class capital, the best-in-class upstream, downstream, link it all together in Saudi, and, that, and that's what we're going to do, midstream. From there, you can start investing up and downstream and, and broadening, but let's do the simple things first. Yeah. Uh, Tom, uh, as you might have uh, picked up, Tom works for ICBC Standard Bank, so uh, it's a mix of uh, a Chinese uh, bank and an uh, African-based uh, bank and uh, with a heavy mining background uh, for the bank. So where is, uh, where is the investment going in that downstream, upstream technology sort of uh, flow of the, of, the, of the supply chain? Thanks, Peter. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the investment, and, and it really speaks to, uh, to what we've been discussing already, that, you know, the investment goes where it's, it's uh, feeling welcome, it's directed partly by policy, it's directed by commercial realities. But, you know, in all of this, you, you kind of, when you're thinking about the investment, and you're thinking about China or you're thinking about Africa, uh, when you start generalizing it, it, it muddies the picture, right? So looking at the, at the China example, the investment historically has come from multiple entities, and those can be state-owned entities, those can be private entities, those are backed by export credit agencies, etc., etc. And the, the investment, the, the trick is finding the right partner for the right piece of investment at the right time. Um, and at the moment, you know, I, I think to echo some of the comments already, if you're if you're here in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and you're looking at that at that China example for, for clues of how to be successful, well, you know, one of the things that the Chinese were very good at were, was taking a long-term strategic view, looking at the Western experience and learning from it, not simply repeating it, but but jumping ahead and jumping well ahead, particularly in, in the in the space of, of technology and batteries and EVs. And so China is a bit is, is a bit further down the road in this and is reacting to, to overseas policy in the case of Indonesia. So you've got the likes of 
of uh, Tsingshan, uh, CMOC going in there for, for the upstream, then followed by CATL and others for, for the midstream. And sooner or later, um, potentially the OEMs will be there if, if it goes that way with the downstream manufacturing. Um, and so uh, generalizations kind of, of uh, uh, are typically not very, very helpful, I find. Um, I think it's fair to say if you, if you look right now, the investment cycle for, for Chinese privately owned corporates, um, it's still pretty healthy. It's fair to say that the SOEs have backed off partly through where we are in the cycle for some of those commodities, partly through um, you know, what's happening in the, in the domestic economy at home. Um, but there's still considerable capital to be deployed at the right time, in the right project, in, in the right jurisdiction. And we, we've talked a couple of times now already about not just getting the dirt out of the ground, but uh, bringing some of the uh, the processing the further downstream in the in the supply chain. Is that happening through this super region as well? Yeah, it is, and, uh, but I don't think it's happening because it's a super region. It's it's happening where it's happening because of uh, various incentive structures, because of of local. Uh, environment is very supportive because you're backed through local partnerships, whether that's with technology institutes, uh, the education uh, system is very supportive. You've got a pool of, of bright engineers on tap. Um, so it is happening. It's happening in parts of Africa. It's happening here in, in the GCC region and it's happening in, in Southeast Asia. But to, to join those dots into a, and, and say it's happening because we've named this now a super region. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a bit of a, um, you're going off on a bit of a tangent there, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I've been sitting in on some sessions with uh, South Africa and uh, Uganda and other African countries, and uh, they're all telling us about how rich they are minerally, so I guess that's where the money is going to be going to. <laughs> Nariman, you, um, you, you, your, your business is in uh, Kazakhstan. Um, right at the, uh, at the east end of the, uh, the super region, and uh, you've got one of the, well, you've got the biggest market next door to you in, in China. So tell us a little bit about the situation in, uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, so you, thank you, Peter. So you're all right. So we are next back to the China. We have the border with them. And of course, uh, as the big mining country as Kazakhstan, we are top 10 producers of copper. We are number one producer of uranium. We are top 10 in zinc and lead. Uh, almost of all our materials goes to China. So we have pretty linked connection infrastructure. Uh, there is also the huge uh, governmental uh, programs from uh, China. As you know, the one road, uh, one belt uh, incentive. And it's been very active during the last 10 years. And it's also make the connection and links between our two countries uh, much, much bigger. So. That's, that's why that, uh, it's pretty good to be the next to this market. So the cost of transportation is pretty low, especially in the railroad. And um, for us, it's, uh, and you know that during the last two years with the situation with, uh, with the Russia and this uh, fail of uh, supply chain, it's pretty hard to export to, uh, to Western markets. So, and of course the importance and uh, the role of uh, China is increasing in the region. But your eggs, so you're getting all your eggs in the China basket, is that? Uh, no, I don't want to say that uh, that's we are putting all the eggs in one basket. So as I mentioned before, uh, Western companies are very active in Kazakhstan and still the biggest investors to Kazakhstan economy is uh, Western companies, uh, US companies in the oil and gas sector. And uh, of course, uh, such a giants as uh, Glencore, Rio, uh, Fortescue is already entered the market. Uh, also, we have the huge interest from the junior uh, companies that coming from uh, Australia mainly and Canadian one. So uh, I think that uh, Kazakhstan tried to diversify all these risks. And um, the one interesting thing is that even we are very close to China, we don't have uh, Chinese uh, uh, mining companies. So they're purchasing all the materials, but they're not still uh, in the market. They're just looking for Kazakhstan one. And, oh, the situation of Western companies, are, I would like to say, very stable, and the legislation and the stability is uh, uh, helping uh, the companies entering this, this market. 
It's very good how you guys all sat in the order that I was going to ask the questions. It, uh, <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny how it worked out that way. Matt, uh, we have touched a little bit on, uh, on governments and what action they've taken in Indonesia, but the geopolitical situation at the moment uh, when it comes to critical minerals sort of adds another dimension to this whole discussion. So uh, what role can governments play which is constructive in this uh, situation where we have increasing demand, incredible demand for these minerals? Well, thanks. And just, just a quick volume check. You can hear me okay in the back? Yep, okay. It's interesting. I've really been reflecting on each of the panelists as they've spoken with a unique viewpoint. And some of that viewpoint comes from where you're from. So if you're in the banking industry, you're in the flow business. You know, you're looking for to, to lend money, have it be repaid, to have transactions. You know, if you're in the corporate business, you're working directionally. And as an investor, we're forming capital around ideas in the future. I guess I really strongly believe in, a, in the emergence of a super region, unlike perhaps you, because I feel like over the last 20 years, we've lived in an environment where we're pushing further and further towards the edge of, a of, a, of efficiency, and capital wants to be free, right? So if capital wants to be free, it's going to go to where it'll make the highest returns, and that paradigm existed for, frankly, the entirety of my career. What we're seeing now is capital can't be free, okay? If capital could be free, Chinese companies uh, could buy anything they want in Australia or Canada, but they can't. If capital could be free, then you would see technology, you know, we're in a deglobalizing world. And so in that deglobalizing world, nearshoring, friendshoring, and your neighbors are exceedingly important. And so as, as I think about, this is my third, you know, this is the third forum here, and over time, the progression towards Vision 2030, it's a very deliberate move by uh, long-term patient stakeholders to create rifts in, in free capital to encourage and incentivize behavior. And what, and what I see you know, is the emergence of a logistical hub and a processing hub here that ends up being the bazaar of the world. If you want to you know, think, step back for a second, national champions are going to win out. So uh, you know, Audi, VW will always have the support of uh, the German government and they're, they're by, therefore the EU and all of the attendant um, you know, IRMA and critical minerals policies and incentives will align around European auto manufacturers. IRA has got to be one of the biggest, it's not, it's not it, it is in some ways an incentive package and in other ways a not you package, right? And so it's very deliberate by the US to say, not you, but yes, you. Now, the, a lot of fine print on what qualifies and what doesn't. And that's, you know, to deal with the practicalities of today's world, how are we going to actually make this happen from here to there? But it's a deliberate move to create new supply chains that funnel towards national champions. Because I don't think in the end the US government really wants to subsidize, uh, uh, you know, Volkswagen, or that the German taxpayer really wants to subsidize BYD or General Motors, right? And so, so the emergence of politics and alignment of supply chain is more important than ever. So from a practical standpoint, how it influences my business, you know, we're, we're headquartered in Australia, our money comes largely from the US and from Euro European family offices. We have, uh, um, and we're looking at should we open up a investment office here somewhere in the Gulf region because the trade flows are enormous and what we see is that the projection of near political power as an investor you can leverage your dollar against all these different programs but you can also have a big brother regionally that will ameliorate some of the difficulties of investing in some of these jurisdictions so it used to be it was you, you know for for me with my accent I was looking for DFC, IFC, um, you know, uh, uh, Western New York based NGOs and banks to invest alongside us. I would argue in North Africa and in, uh, you know, um, in this super region, you would want to have a strong partner aligned from an investment standpoint. So if something starts to go akimbo, you have people in the region with deep multi-generational networks and context that can help keep your, your, uh, your investments on track. 
So, you know, I guess geopolitics have never been more important. You know, the world is fracturing into multiple supply chains. The game that's afoot here is can this be, can this be a place where the low cost energy can lead to processing and those units can fill Michael's supply chain wherever they may be, left, right, you know, north, south, whatever it may be. And it's incredibly important what's going on and, and to think about where you're, whether you're a company looking to develop or a minister looking to legislate or an investor looking to put dollars to work, trying to contextualize what, those, what change you're happy in and then how to how, you know, figure out what's going on in those baskets. Yeah. So all of this has happened before. All the programs we're seeing right now, small, medium-sized business loans, tax gives, like all of this has happened before, so none of it is new. It's simply adapted to where today is. So if you take something like uh, um, the, the Australian Critical Minerals Fund, honestly, that's a signal of frustration more than anything because there already, there already is NAIF and CEFC and lots of different things where people are saying, hey, we, could, we can give you a lower cost of capital now all of a sudden, here's another pocket saying, we're really frustrated, we're legislating, can private capital, can private markets please deliver into what we're asking for? And the answer, as most practitioners here know, is that yes, but it takes a long time. So when I see, you know, it, and it's gonna happen again, by the way, there'll be another, there was a, at, I was at COP28 and it's a $60 billion climate fund, right? Frustration, how can we move faster? We'll, put, we'll make more money available. We'll give you negative cost capital. That's just policymakers saying, we want to move faster against our targets. And the reality of the private sector saying, either one, I can't do it, two, I'm not prepared to do it, or three, I'm a little bit nervous about doing it. You know? And over time, uh, those programs will either fund or not fund and work out. But, I, but when you see those direct giveaway programs or those direct incentive programs, note that they usually come with strings, lots of them. Those strings make it hard for the private market to access them, so they don't get used. So you really view them more as a sign of frustration, acceleration, price signal, than actual pocket of money to go attached to. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to ask, the last question I'm going to ask, and I'll, you guys can answer it or we can just leave it hanging, but um, coming from China, where I've watched these guys developing the technology to, to get these critical minerals to battery stage. They've been doing this for 20 odd years. Um, we're, we're talking about finding the critical minerals at the moment, but how are we going to get, accelerate this, this super region to be able to deliver on the, the technology as well? Where, where is the technology development going to come from and how are we going to get the, the batteries made? So that's, that's one thing where I thought that, uh, Michael, where I thought you were right on point is that the technology is mature. And so you're watching innovative young companies find and license technology and or partner because the auto manufacturers have their cell manufacturers have a long acceptance time frame for mobility uh, applications for industrial minerals. So those processing technologies are mature. There, there's a lot of innovation, but I would agree with you that that maturity angle is there. And I suspect that it's already happening. In the next three years, we'll see multiple licenses of different intermediate and, high and, and late stage uh, battery chains and, and ex established partners just simply moving into the region. You're worried, Michael, do you have a view? Um, I mean, the, the, the two going to $4 billion in Australia and the $3,750 per car that the IRA does is irrelevant in the broader scheme of things. I mean, ultimately, you're trying to get the best auto to a consumer at the lowest cost, and that $3,750 doesn't do anything to do that. I mean, governments, I think, need to realise that the only way to diversify the supply chain is in to incentivise private capital in a meaningful way, which 
if you look at Saudi, they really have the ability to do so through the leverage that they're putting on um, capital projects in in Saudi and the way that they're they're looking to supplement upstream investments through equity investments through you know Manara and other other vehicles and and that's the way to diversify the supply chain rather than shut it out embrace it and provide competitive capital to compete with it great i was really sorry we've run out of time i would like to keep talking for another 20 minutes or 50 minutes if we if we could afford it but we haven't so thank you guys for making such a great contribution. Uh, it's late in the conference and I really appreciate you doing that. And thank you for coming to listen to us. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to take some questions from you from the floor, but it's been really great. And thank you for your participation in FNF. We'll see you all next year. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.